Zihle Ngobese is someone who, if he chose to run for president, would have my vote. Big Daddy Liberty, as he's professionally known and loved, is an incredible individual and someone that we as South Africans can be incredibly proud to have on our side. He's a libertarian, he has a heart of gold, and he has chosen to be our conscience, and so rightly so. Please join me in an incredible conversation with an amazing young man as we discuss politics in South Africa, what it means to be a libertarian, what it means to give up a highly lucrative and successful corporate career to choose to fight for your people, for every South African. We cover so many incredible topics in this conversation that this is one you may want to allocate a full hour and 20 minutes to. Despite multiple challenges in setting up the recording and in the recording itself, which I recorded months ago with him and has taken me this long to get the editing done because we had so many interruptions, this is one you are not going to want to miss. Welcome to Coffee and Conversations with Champions as I sit down with the legend, the icon, and the true mensch, Big Daddy Liberty. And I did tend to butcher your name, but that's my dyslexic brain that kind of panics and locks up. So we got Sile and Gobese. How was that? Still butchered. Sile and Gobese. Sile. Sile and Gobese. Perfect. Ah, excellent. Okay, cool. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> so it's, it's a, I think it's going to become a tradition now when we meet or chat. I'll just butcher your name the first time. Sorry, man. <laughs> That's it. So welcome to Coffee and Conversations with Champions. And this is the leadership edition, mm. because that's really what you are. You're a leader and you're a role model to so many in multiple communities in South Africa and worldwide as well. So if you could give us a little bit of an intro as to who you are. In 15 years in insurance, we were told it's the Ben Duffy, your elevator pitch uh, introduction. So, yeah. And also Big Daddy Liberty. I mean, that's, I want to know where that comes from. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for having me um, on the show. And, you know, it's so weird being a guest on the show. One is usually the host. Yep. <laughs> so one has a, a, a body of, of language, a lexicon you've developed because you're the host. But nonetheless, my name is Sisle Ngobese. I'm better known as Big Daddy Liberty. It's a almost stage name that I use. I think we uh, have to do this, sorry, by the way. We'll just quickly. Oh, oh yeah. No. <laughs> the horns came through. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I'm, I'm a South African through and through. I'm very passionate about the country I was born in, I live in. Um, I am someone who really, in being passionate, have also decided to do something about, you know, helping shape or direct the country in a direction, which I argue much better for the average South African. That direction, of course, is one which is founded in the very thing that South Africans have never really had. You know, whether you go back in our history to our colonial days, uh, the mm. dark days of apartheid, or even today, uh, with the sort of African nationalist type politics that we see play out in our in our body politics, the one that we've never had through those three uh, periods is a society genuinely defined by freedom and by liberty. The notions of liberty as a political philosophy, and that's what I therefore stand for and advocate mm. for. This idea of how do we build a free, prosperous, non-racial, and property-owning society. The very things that, as I've just said now, were you know relegated to some, but not everybody in the society. So this is the work that I do. And a lot of you might be asking, you know, why do you do this work? You know, what were you doing before? <laughs> and lady to do this, for example. Well, you know, I, I'm one of the South Africans who also, you know, Grew up in Durban, uh, went to uh, Natal University, mm. did the whole undergrad thing, uh, went to UCT, tried to do the whole postgrad thing. 
Uh, and like any other young person, I worked for a while. You know, I worked in politics, I worked in government uh, and, and the private sector. And I just said, you know, is this really how I want to spend my life? Yeah, look, I'm making wonderful money. You know, it's, it was a middle class existence mm -hmm. uh, with all the trappings. But there was always that nagging voice at the back saying, yeah, dude, you're living this great life, but the vast majority of South Africans around you are simply not. Uh, and at some point I just decided, okay, stuff it. I'm going to give up this life. Uh, I sold my properties mm. and, you know, gave up the job and literally with those savings uh, started this, this whole Big Daddy Liberty movement and basically online podcast and advocacy work because it's not just a podcast. You know, a lot of people sort of think, uh, yeah. you know, it's me sitting in front of a camera waffling, uh, but it's not just that. You know, I physically travel around this country talking to ordinary people, persuading them in advocating for and standing for, rather, um, liberty ideas. So in a nutshell, that's effectively what I do. Um, and I do that, if you will, in partnership with the Institute of Race Relations, uh, which are a who are a 90 year uh, old uh, uh, organization, an NGO that does this kind of work, too, which, you know, it, it tries to push classically liberal ideas into South African society. Right. Fantastic. What was what was the point, or let me say this rather, how long did that thought process nag at you from when you started your career and started working and then started to see that? Were you really serving yourself um, in the best way? How long, did, how many years or was that or months? How long was that process? Well, I mean, I'll be frank. It, it, it really compounded itself because as I said, I cut my teeth mm -hmm. in politics and mm -hmm. uh, the private sector and the government. Politics in the private and uh, public sectors, perhaps where it really became a, a nagging and gnawing at me voice. In so far as you know, I was within the DA for a very long time. That's the only real party I uh, ever supported at, at one point. Um, and it was in a DA government that I worked. You know, I worked with uh, Premier then Premier Helen Zilla under her administration. And, you know, I was the spokesperson for her social development department. So that department by its nature deals with the most vulnerable in society, whether mm -hmm. it's the poorest in society, whether it's children who are at risk, um, the elderly and disabled people. So working in that department really opened my eyes um, to the the state, I don't want to say the plight, you know, the people like using mm. that expression, oh, it opened my eyes to the plight of South Africans. No, it opened my eyes, because we, we all know what the plight of South Africans is, but I don't think we truly know what the state of those South Africans are. You know, the, when you walk into a home, and I use the word, the word home liberally here, when you walk into a you know, four-walled corrugated iron shack, and the only thing you see in there is, you know, sort of a fireplace with a very black tin pot, and clearly this is what they're using to cook with. Mm. That gives you a strong sense of this person is living in a free South Africa, yes, but they themselves are not free. There are a basket of policy intervention, wow. interventions that should be aimed directly at that person. In fact, that person should be almost solely the beneficiary of a hand up from mm. government mm. as opposed to what is the status quo where people who actually really benefit from government are well healed, well to do people and in them being well healed and well to do also most importantly have a very close proximity to politicians yeah. that's who really benefits from the state in this country and i took exception to that that really bothered me uh, and it is what i think catalyzed me to say okay great how do we then reconcile how i feel and what i know needs to be done with wanting to sort of live this middle class existence you know mm -hmm. and, and and worry about myself uh, so, arguably, let's call it from 2016 to 2018 is where it really began to sort of develop and mature um, into this crystallized thought, one which then also takes the risk of giving up that middle class existence to do this. Yes. I mean, that's, was there a particular tipping point or was it that you were gathering information on how to be effective mm. when you made the change? 
Great question. I think Big Daddy Liberty as a brand is pretty old. It's maybe mm-hmm. since 2010. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was just an online persona. Like, just, you know, oh, he tweets libertarian stuff and, you know, he trolls politicians, etc., etc. et cetera. Uh, 2018 is the year where I literally decided to act on it and say, okay, mm-hmm. it's one thing to be this online persona with a big following, but it's another to actually... Um, go out into the communities that you claim you speak for or not that i really claim that i speak for but mm-hmm. rather i claim i want to work with is mm-hmm. the expression i was looking for um it's one thing to claim that and to talk about it. it's the other to actually do it so 2018 is a year where i literally <clears throat> almost the job of the hat you know i resigned uh sold property moved from cape town where i settled at that point um, and came to Joburg to set up shop here. Uh, thankfully, at that stage, you know, the Institute of Race Relations, also, you know, a, a good friend of mine, Franz Cranier, who used to be the CEO of the organization, was like, hey, man, if you're looking to do that, then come yoke yourself with us who are doing that work, albeit through a very certain uh, an old school avenue. You know, the, uh, the IR um, is, as I said, it's a 90 year old organization. Mm-hmm. And it's a 90-year-old organization. Like, it does, still does things in a very old way. And, you know, joining them was more about also modernizing the liberal message. How do we right. actually modernize that message and bring it into communities that historically never really heard liberal ideas, even though they themselves, and I gut feeling, are liberals. People yearn for freedom. People yeah. yearn to better their lives as individuals. And really, I talk a lot about the individual, but really we're a family society. Mm-hmm. And insofar as I refer to the individual, I'm referring to families. The individual will do anything and everything for the benefits of family. And that's where policy needs to speak in this country. And that's where liberals like me do the work, if you will. So I think it was just a culmination of realizing that I'm not going to help the situation. This is around 2018. I'm not going to help this country by staying in this plush government job. Mm -hmm. I actually need to be on the ground and do something. And yeah, fine. You know, you're going to give up a lot of creature comforts, you know, the the nice home. What in your background made you want to really help? Because there are a lot of people that go through university, they want to build their careers, they want to focus on themselves, and they figure, well, I'll help out as I build my career and my business, where they're more mm-hmm. I-focused. You are mm-hmm. more we-focused. So w- mm-hmm. was there anything in particular in your upbringing, in your experience, or, or was it a general thing that you saw that made you say, you know what, this is what I want to do with my life? You know, the funny thing is, even that individual who is self-interested and says, hey, by improving me, the mm. I, yes. taking care and improve the, everybody around me, that, that's totally legitimate. That is totally legitimate. In fact, that's kind of what you want in a society, right? You want people to take self-ownership, to have a sense of agency, and with that agency then decide, in other words, have the mm-hmm. freedom to decide what and who they help and etc cetera, etc cetera. because you tend to find it's that individual who does much more mm-hmm. for the benefit of society than you know the the converse which is this expectation that someone else or read into that the state will do this and and help people because that, that never works right. again the record of history is absolutely crystal clear on this you do not you cannot build a prosperous property owning society um by expecting the state to, you know, sort of have responsibilities that are not of the state that actually belong to individuals and families mm-hmm. and communities. But to get to your question directly, I'll say this. Um, I think it really took me understanding that you could, or in this case, I could be much more useful by using my actual skills that God mm-hmm. has given me um, more directly with people. You know, I. I've always said this, you know, if there's one thing I know is, is a genuine gift I have with God, from God is mm-hmm. my ability to connect with people, my ability to articulate ideas in a simple way, super simple way, in a persuasive way. And I said, okay, okay great, you know, I could do this, I could sell the skill to a political party or a government mm-hmm. or whatever the case may be to achieve their goals, or I could just 
do it myself and almost you know build it yourself ethos which i speak a lot of ironically on the show you know we've coined it the masakele culture masakele mm-hmm. being a zulu word for build it yourself and something we'll be pushing as a campaign going forward but i digress so i think it really was that it was this idea that god has given me these skills and i could literally monetize them and use them in you mm-hmm. know spaces where that you know they're very valuable or I could do this work, which is to directly talk to people and to build this brand very slowly over time for it to become an alternative um, movement, you know, much mm-hmm. like the Africana community has Afri Forum or Solidarity. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm of the firm view that, you know, br- a broader mix of South Africans could have a alternative movement like this one that advocates for these principles of a free, property owning, prosperous, non-racial, and effectively do it yourself society. Yes, the state will always be there, but these ideas have to be pushed by someone. So that someone right now is me and others in society. Absolutely. It's and then we can touch on that as well. Let's talk about liberty. What if you could give a description of liberty to someone who had never heard the concept before? And also why is it so important to be a property owner? Um, again, it's a, here's the most simplest way of putting it. It's, it's, it's basically, liberty is a state of being free. The idea that you're being free within a society and you're free from oppressive restrictions imposed by an authority, in most cases a government, <clears throat> on one's way of life, behavior, or political views. That is the most succinct definition of liberty I can give. And in that political philosophy, there are many tenets, therefore, around how do we express or give expression to the notion of freedom as a political mm-hmm. concept. You know, you can look at it through the prism of philosophy, or pardon me, you can look at it through the prism of, you know, a social lens, a political lens, and really an economic lens. Now, the economic lens is perhaps the the lowest hanging fruit in so far as how do you give people the freedom for them to earn an income, build savings and to keep and build that wealth over time. Now to do those three things, you need as least, as least rather, um, you know, either uh, legally or illegally uh, confiscating authorities of mm-hmm. your wealth and income, right? So in a legal sense, you know, it will be government and its taxes. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, a libertarian or a classical liberal will always argue for a very, very low tax type society where wealth really should be in the hands of people and not the government and politicians. Um, and in an illegal sense, of course, uh, protecting people from a criminal. A criminal steals your money um, or, or tries to loot something from you that isn't there. So right. uh, in both those instances, the state ironically plays a, sta- a role. Insofar as in the first instance, the, pl- the state plays a less of a role, taxes the least. And in the latter, the state plays the role of protecting you from criminality, right? The, mm-hmm. Those are the uh, definitions, or rather that's the role of the state. And so whenever people talk about liberty, I want to simplify it this way. It's basically living in a society with three major components. And let's see if I can sort of rattle them off here in, mm-hmm. uh, in a succinct way. The one is the individual uh, does more and the government does less. Uh, the individual mm-hmm. owns more and the government owns less and the individual spends more and the government spends less. That is a sort of broad philosophical overview with a emphasis on the individual i.e. families, as opposed to a society dominated by the state and politicians. And in doing so, that society therefore understands what the role of the state is. And and it's a limited one. Uh, That's differentiation Mm -hmm. between liberty uh, advocates and everybody else, is that we seek to limit the state to three fundamental things. One, protecting South Africans from foreign aggression. So the idea that we should have a standing army, a diplomatic corps that represents us on an international stage, um, and of course, the protection of the nation state. That's protect us from foreign aggression. Second one is to protect us from domestic uh, threats. So in that instance, we have a police force, say, uh, you know, correctional services uh, and the enforcement of contracts by mm-hmm. the state. 
you know, um, so if you and I agree contractually that we're doing the show, then, you know, if I break that contract, you should be able to have recourse to, you know, get uh, compensation for that. And the third, of course, is the, the arbitration of our disputes, the mediating of our disputes. So Africa is a country of 60 million people, 12 languages, 11 languages, 12 being the sign language, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and multiple cultures. Of course, a society like that will have disputes between people every now and then. And what you want in a functional free society is a judiciary, a justice system of our peers that is able to arbitrate our disputes. So those three things are literally the role of the state in a society of people who understand that the individual and really families have primacy over everything. So that's what a libertarian or a Catholic right. liberal, someone who advocates for liberty, would then uh, stand for. So I think chatting about libertarian, uh, being a liberal, libertarianism, if I, if I got that mm -hmm. right, where did those views evolve for you? Why was that the path you chose mm -hmm. to go down? I, I'm a firm believer that the average individual is libertarian at heart insofar as people simply say, just get out of my business, allow me to do what I need to do. And as long as I'm not harming anybody else, mm -hmm. um, I, should, I should have the freedom to do as I please. That is a libertarian at heart. I mean, I could give you a wonderful textbook definition of it, but effectively that is a libertarian mm -hmm. at heart. And I would argue, most of Africans are rather libertarian and conservative generally in their outlook. We don't reflect that in our politics, ironically, uh, but we do reflect it on a everyday, day-to-day -day basis where people often ask the question, how is it possible that South Africans um, you know, seem to be so bitter and you know, there's all these sort of fights on social media, mm. but the actual society itself is very cohesive, works together very well, and, you know, really is a live and let live uh, type society. And I've always argued it's because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a notion of where the values, where the loudest voices and the values mm -hmm. are, right? right? The loudest voices in everyday life are people who literally have that philosophy of, hey, live and let live. As long as you don't bother me, um, I'm happy to go about my day. And hey, I'm even happy to lend us a hat. You know, if I recognize that you're struggling, whatever the case may be, that's a libertarian philosophy. Uh, um, okay. And the values carry themselves out through society, where, as I said earlier on, we are a family orientated society. You know, we, we, we don't hold these, as politicians would have us believe, we don't hold these sort of mega. Uh, you know, social socialist rather views of, oh, I'm doing things for the fatherland. I'm doing mm -hmm. things for, you know, the, the greater good of society. No, people don't really act that way. People say, actually, I'm self-interested and in my self-interest, there will be beneficiaries around me. So if I want to be a doctor, or a, an accountant, whatever the case may be, I don't need some government bureau telling me that this is what society needs. Uh, no, I, I'm doing this of my own volition. And ironically, or incidentally, it is the society that benefits from me pursuing my own interests. So that is effectively uh, a, a, an ethos I think I grew up with it, and I grew around, uh, and most of us do. And it's one which if you then have the privilege of a university education, are able to read a lot more on, um, and then crystallize and realize, oh, it's, this is called libertarianism? I didn't mm -hmm. know that. I just thought it was a natural state of being. Um, and again, I'm not suggesting that libertarianism or classical liberalism requires a university education. No, not at all. I just think, for me, it's something I came across in a crystallized form, an academic form, if you will, at university. However, it just codified who I already was and who the right. people around me already were. So how did you evolve the brand from being on Twitter? I love the term trolling politicians. I think that's a responsibility for all of us. And you know, <laughs> absolutely, they need to be accountable. If you want to get into politics, you've got to be accountable. And the one thing also, I, you know, I just want to chat about the evolution of the brand you know, how you got through those times. It was a big decision to make, which we've spoken about, and how you've evolved it and where you want to see it go. But uh, what I love about your description, to me, it sounds like trusting people to be capable because they mm -hmm. are. 
right? You're capable to do what you need to do. No one knows you better than you know yourself. And I think the value, yeah, within South Africa, I'm not sure if my stats are correct. I think the average per South African who is employed supports between eight and nine people. Um, you know, so that that's very much, you know, community. Family is community with for us. So, how did you so talk, let's talk about the evolution of the brand yeah big daddy liberty is is a character i've been cooking up mm. for a while because i've always argued that you know on the one hand the name is weird and catchy for a lot of people mm -hmm. <laughs> um and you know on the other it's 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 two versions of me that are sort of melded together uh, so the name big daddy is one i actually acquired um you know during my rugby days uh, mm -hmm. back in my in my time um i have to ask you what's and uh so i went to hillcrest but i okay. played varsity varsity rugby okay um and that name just sort of stuck oh, there goes big daddy on the field right um you know sort of it's barreling through um and i just said okay cool that's the one nickname i've always had and the one thing i stand for is liberty so let me just melt those two together you know the name big daddy liberty was born um, but beyond that, I also wanted a character name, something that people can go, oh, have you heard of Big Daddy Liberty set? Um, mm -hmm. Have you watched the Big Daddy Liberty show? Um, so it was just at a pure, you know, bland, boring level. It was a name, it was two nicknames that I just put together. Um, but the show itself was one which, as I said, it began around 2018. Um, and I've always had a vision of slowly building this online platform. Uh, over time, because you know, I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a journalist. I'm not a media person, so to speak. So this for me was always a secondary thing. The primary thing is the advocacy work, which leads me travel around the country, physically talking to people in mostly rural and township communities. Mm. Um, so the show, ironically, was always a secondary. It's just something I like to do. You know, turn on a camera lens and you share your ideas with people. What I didn't anticipate was how to grow relatively quickly, uh, I, I say relatively quickly, still took four or five years, right. um, but it, 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 it had its moments too where it became viral, which I didn't anticipate. So that sort of necessitated me understanding this world of podcasting a lot more better, because people sort of think I'm like a super tech savvy individual, and I'm like, mm, no, I'm not, I'm quite old <laughs> school actually. Uh, right. um, and this project was one that was meant to be on the ground in communities around the country, building a network of liberty oriented people who could then put that influence into our politics going forward into the right. future. That's the real goal of Big Daddy Liberty. It isn't the podcasting, it isn't the shows and you know the trolling, it's actually really doing the on the ground work that changes and persuades people that South Africa must head in a freedom direction. Why is it, do you think, that we don't have a deep connection or understanding of liberty? I think, as you said, we know it intrinsically, but it's not something that perhaps we realize we deserve. South Africa, unfortunately, and I began the story here, mm. has always been a very paternalistic, nationalistic society where we've struggled one version of nationalism to the mm. next, right? So our colonial days saw us straddling an English-British colonialism uh, in this country up until about 1910 when it became the Union of South Africa and really a bit further than that, the 60s, uh, mm. where South Africa became a republic. Um, and even in doing that, it then transitioned into another version of nationalism, namely Africana nationalism, or at least the Nats abused Africana nationalism in order to push their political program of racial segregation. And it hasn't really moved from beyond that, even post-1994, where when the ANC took over, it then substituted Africana nationalism for African nationalism or black nationalism by arguing that really society should be centered around one's Africanness or blackness. And mm. then, for instance, opportunity in society or winners, the, the picking of winners and losers in society should be done on the basis of who is more close to the shade of being black than the, the rest in society. It's a toxic philosophy that we've had in this country you know, since, as I said, our colonial days. And in it being that toxic, it also has a paternalistic uh, element, the idea that the state shall, right, 
It's mm. almost a, uh, a new religion in a sense, where you know we all sort of sit back and wait for the state to do something, uh, either you know as either for us or to punish someone else that we want mm. punished on our behalf. That has always been the relationships that Africans have had with the state, and in that relationship, there is never going to be any space for the flourishing of freedom or even liberty right. values, and why? Because most people expect that they cede their freedoms to someone else to do something, as I said, for mm -hmm. them or against someone else on their behalf. So that culture is the one which I'm trying to break in this country by saying, actually, there is greater enjoyment in mm -hmm. assuming your God-given freedoms. And notice how I say they're God-given. I don't believe that rights are a something that government apportions mm -hmm. to us, you know, and, and it's the one disagreement I have with our constitution in terms of how it's framed. You know, it's almost sort of suggested you know, the, the Bill of Rights is something the state must, um, mm -hmm. as the constitution says, progressively uh, realize, and that's just simply not true. Those rights are God given, they inherit, and the responsibility of these rights are primarily ours, to which the state has a secondary supporting role to it. Right. That is the philosophy of the change in culture that I'm trying to shift in this country so far as the work that I do. Mm -hmm. it, it's so interesting that you say that, and it made me think of my experiences working with addicts in recovery. So where, you know, I've been sober for 17 years. I've been working with addicts for 16 years. Thank you. Uh, crazy. And the thing that this reminds me of is when I see kids from usually wealthy homes that have everything done for them. Every time they, they fail, the parents get them pushed through. Every time they break something, the parents catch them. All of these things. So th they've never learned the consequences. But the real damage that I see that do is the child feels they're being raised as an accessory. And they don't have any value. They're not seen as a person. They're seen as a thing. Because all of that help from the parents comes with tremendous expectation of the sacrifice of self. You can't be who you are. You can't be what you want to be. You have to be the good child because we're happy. You've got to make us happy. And there's almost that sort of concept in the people are not people. They're accessories to the state. Mm. Um. Ironically, it goes far deeper than this, because mm. uh, even as you're talking, and this is the one place where my psychology degree comes in handy. <laughs> um, Excellent. You know, the, the, there are certain things you can extrapolate at an individual level that you see as harmful behaviors replicated at government mm. level, right? And the one thing is this notion of removing personal responsibility and agency from mm -hmm. individuals, and why? Because there is always the expectation that someone else of a higher authority will mm -hmm. do something for you, will help you, or literally will, will, will you know, uh, take over, if you will. Now, there's good, good and bad to that. At the individual level, and so far as raising children, you know, it's, it's, it's an insanely difficult, terrible rather thing to do, because effectively you're cuddling individuals um, away from building the necessary social, interpersonal, and uh, you know, interpersonal skills rather, um, to effectively carry their own weight in society, to be able to deal with hardship um, and push through it. Right, this idea of allowing right. fear, for example, to not be the stumbling block in front of you, but rather the thing that pushes you from behind, mm -hmm. or to allow adversity in the same vein. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, a good book around this is the. Uh, the Cuddling of the American Mind by Jonathan Haidt, um, where he, he basically, quite in, in a very short uh, descriptor, it's, it's about how good intentions and bad ideas are setting up a generation um, for basically failure. Um, and it's those two things, the confluence of those two things, uh, the idea of good intentions and bad ideas, that extrapolate, as I said, from the parent level, where the, the mm -hmm. parent sort of overly protective, mm -hmm. coddles the child, tries to shield them from the world, thus the child never developing the requisite skills to deal with that world. Um, and extrapolating that same approach to the government level, where as I began earlier on, for instance, I argued that South Africa has always had that kind of society, 
where there's mm-hmm. the expectation that government, daddy government, if you will, mm-hmm. will coddle us. Right. Uh, initially based on our identity, whether you were, you know, in a colonial South Africa, African national South Africa, or African national South Africa today, you know, there's always this expectation that government should coddle us mm-hmm. from the realities, shield us from having to develop the necessary interpersonal skills um, and actual, you know, developmental skills um, that allow us to deal with the real world and the consequences of that. You know, good intentions they may be, right? Of having someone who's protective. You know, that it's always sold in that sort of language, mm. uh, shrouded in good intentions. Mm-hmm. But the bad ideas inherent in it, uh, or rather, the good intentions hide the effects of the bad ideas inherent in it. And right. the bad, bad ideas can stem from anything to, as I said, picking winners and losers in society based on race. You know, mm. people always shroud that or, uh, you know, sort of uh, conceal that behind, oh, but the intentions are good. You know, if you look at our history, they'll argue, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, because black people were were denied opportunity in the past, you therefore need a system today that favors black people over everybody else. Now, again, it's draped in good intentions, but the ideas are bad Mm -hmm. ones. Things like affirmative action and black economic empowerment. These are terrible ideas. And why? Simply because they're open to the manipulation and the coercive Mm -hmm. nature of the state. Let me be precise and specific. So again, someone will sell you a policy like BE as being Mm -hmm. well-intentioned, right? A good thing. Oh, uh, you know, it's allowing black people access to a portion of the economy that was relegated to whites only Mm -hmm. in the past. And then you ask that person, okay, great. The intention sound, as as you're selling them, good on paper, but what has been the outcome? of that actual policy? Well, the outcome has been, it hasn't been black people who have been beneficiaries of BE. Instead, it has been connected, politically connected Mm. black individuals who themselves were already well to do, who have been beneficiaries of BE. So that the very intentions of the policy are undermined by the actual outcomes of the policy. But again, it's that notion of good intentions in a society coming against the bad ideas in them. And these are the things that I fight insofar as the work that I do, where I say, actually, if I may stick with the BEE analogy for a moment, what you need in society isn't a BEE or a black economic empowerment, much like in apartheid or colonial days, you had a Africana or white economic empowerment. What you need today is a South African economic empowerment. Mm -hmm. In other words, a policy that addresses the, the core issue, which is poverty. A government should be able to come to you and say, listen, I will help you because you're poor, not because you're black. Mm -hmm. And invariably, a policy approach like that one will, of course, cater to mostly black individuals who are historically and currently poor, because that is the current state of things. But there is less of an uh, ability, excuse me, to corrupt that policy approach simply because it targets the thing that matters and not the thing that is relevant. So if you target race, that's easy to corrupt because it will be well-to-do, politically connected people of that race who benefit, just like you had the same thing, uh, ironically, during the apartheid days. Right. Even though it also had policies that were preferential towards white individuals, but it was usually politically connected, well to do white indiv- individuals who really made it above the average ordinary Joe. Mm-hmm. Again, that's not to say that you know ordinary whites didn't benefit. Of course, they did. But if you look at the on a, if you have a sense of proportion on things, you'll quickly realize that some of the biggest names back then who became captains of industry were people who had a very close proximity to nat, nat politicians at the yeah. time. And we've simply replicated that behavior today. So that it comes back to uh, me condensing this response this way. The whole notion of liberty, the whole notion of being a freedom advocate is to push for ideas in society, which are on the one hand, good ideas, and that they're good ideas, not because of their intentions solely, but because the outcomes, insofar as they are tried and tested in history, have shown that they're good. Fantastic. Now, to, to touch on a, a slightly more personal note, when you're on the ground, when you're going into these communities and you're seeing the real challenges that people are facing, I know from my personal experience when I do talks about alcoholism and addiction and surviving abuse and I go out into rural areas like up, you know, the beautiful mountains of Natal from Richmond up into these small villages of 300, 500 people. And you see the, the incredible passion, energy, and commitment 
of the people in those communities, but the very difficult situations that they're living under. How do you deal with that on an ongoing basis, personally, seeing the suffering and, and the struggle? And I think the, the, the struggle of potential and the denial of potential, that's what gets me. That's, that's what breaks my heart. And that's what I try mm -hmm. to work through in our businesses. How do you deal with that? You know, one has to develop something which is unnatural to them, mm. or at least un unnatural to me. I'm, I'm a very deep empath, mm -hmm. um, and I take on other people's emotional state, be state of being far too easily. And in the line of work that I do, you have to develop, as I said, something which is deeply unnatural to you, which is a very thick skin, and the, inabil and the ability, rather, to much like water, water of a duck's back, to not let something linger on you, uh, even though you have to be immersed in it, right, in mm -hmm. order to address it and work with it, um, in order to change it. So that's been the first thing. But the, here's the real kicker here. It's also a reminder, you have to constantly remind you, yourself, rather, why you're doing what you're doing, mm -hmm. um, so that you don't get lost in the everyday, right? You don't get lost in the weeds, yeah. so to speak. Well, you um, don't get lost in you don't get lost in your thick skin as well, <coughs> because you have to True. allow some of that in. Absolutely, and because you can't be alienating in, in your approach to people too. Um, and it's funny the two things that we're discussing here, insofar as what you do and what you've. Um, the goals of what you're trying to do mm. versus what I do actually speak to each other. Mm -hmm. There is a highly, an, a, a big uptick in the rates of substance abuse in this country, primarily because two, of two things. One, at a policy level, we have not focused on strengthening families in this country. That is the first port of failure for most individuals who, um, you know, who, who get sucked into a life of depending on a substance, whether it's hard narcotics or, or even mm. alcohol, mm. to be brutally honest. I mean, there are very large numbers of alcohol abuse, uh, big numbers in that regard in this country. And of course, the, the effects of it, the externalities of it, such as fetal alcohol syndrome, mm. and you know, one can go down the line in this area. Um, the family, as I said, there's two things, the family and the breakdown of the family and the lack of support for family creation in this country is one of those aspects. The second, of course, is just the economic status of the country. If you live in a society that offers you little to no hope mm. um, and little to no opportunity, it is very easy for someone in a situation like that to fall into a form of escapism. Uh, that is offered by alcohol and drugs and whatever the case may be, and so that I, and hear me carefully here. I'm not mm -hmm. blaming the people. I'm not yeah. blaming the addicts. One hundred percent. I'm blaming a society so constructed in a perverse way that throughout the historical record of colonial days, apartheid, and today, we have relegated South African families mm. to into a broken state of things. In fact, some mm. policies back in the past were you know, actually actively trying to break families, i.e. the migrant labor system, for example, that and separated your men from, yeah. and the DOP system in the Western Cape. Mm -hmm. One can go down the line. Yeah. But insofar as today, where there has been a need by the current government administration to fix this and actually invest heavily in the family, primarily, mm -hmm. we simply haven't done that. Mm -hmm. And we're now seeing the effects of that. So that it does take people like you in the context in which you work in, and people like me in the context in which we work in, to help piece the society together. And that's the hard work. And that's why yeah. politicians yeah. don't do it. Yeah. It's the hard work. It's the, it's the part that doesn't win your votes. It's the part that doesn't have glamorous ribbon cutting things. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the part that ironic, or no, I should stop saying ironic, it's the part that sadly is, is what's desperately needed yeah. because it's the consistent work. It's what consistently gets, that is, it's consistent effort in this kind of work that yields results that are tangible in a meaningful way. So that, that, that's why you don't see the political class doing this work. So let me come back to really addressing your question mm -hmm. directly of how you don't let this affect effectively you insofar as you trying to do the work. Mm. Um, 
you always have to understand where the genesis of everything is and understand at an empathetic level why some other person would not be in the same situation of relative privilege as you are. And I use that, let me just quickly put it in sure. provisio here. Yeah? I don't use the word privilege in, in how most leftists use it mm -hmm. as, as an indictment. Oh, you're privileged, how dare you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they sort of add race to it, like, oh, why privilege, they say, which is all mm -hmm. poppycock. How I use the word privilege is in the actual meaning of the word, which is you want people to be privileged. You want to expand and 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 um, yeah, that's right, expand uh, a privilege in society, or privileges in society rather, as a a, a norm, a base. Mm -hmm. You want people to be in strong, stable families, preferably nuclear families, where there's support for a child from both parents. Those sort of uh, psychological cues a child receives in a two-parent household. Again, the psychological literature on this is is absolutely well developed. Mm -hmm. I don't need to necessarily do, uh, argue for it here. There is a great benefit for children growing up in two parent households. It creates a sense of stability that is yep. far more superior than any other approach uh, that you can try in society. Let me be precise and specific. In those mm -hmm. societies, in those cultural groupings, where there is an emphasis on the development of two parent mm -hmm. households, there are better outcomes for those children than children from single parent households or as is the specter in this country of no parent households yeah. either. I mean, I'll use the, a community I'm very close to, uh, the Jewish community, as a great example. Jews make every effort uh, at gearing their society culturally and physically towards family creation mm -hmm. in every respect. Um, and family creation is clearly defined a mother and a father in a household raising children. I'm just going to let this helicopter sort of fly by. Um, I was going to say, and the guilt they use to do that is incredibly powerful. <laughs> Insanely powerful. The pressure you'll get from your rabbi to get married. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, God I help you if you. God help you if you're single and over twenty-two. <laughs> mm, mm. Oh my! Yeah. Um, but again, it's 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 that sort of social pressure though, which I always sort of laugh at right now in a sort of mm. jerky way, but actually is very powerful yeah. it's instrumental in the preservation of a group a group um yeah. culturally and socially and that should be something we should we should be spreading as an ethos mm -hmm. to the rest of south africans it should be something which at a policy level at a government level it, there should be provision for there should be provision to saying look as a government or even for example tax you way less almost at a neg negligible level mm -hmm. if you are a married individual raising kids yeah. right so in fact if, if i had things my way just to sort of be slightly populist here, like a politician you know i'd go the direction of hungry um mm -hmm. I didn't go even further. I'd say if you're married in this country, you know, the two of you basically will pay no income tax um, in lieu of the fact that you're supporting a family. And there'll be even, you know, VAT exemptions galore because you're trying to raise the next generation of the country. I mean, I'll go even further, but nonetheless, the point is, um, it's, it's these sort of approaches that we are sorely missing as mm -hmm. South Africans because, as I sort of tried to make the argument earlier, we're not seeing this be a priority of the political elites in this country and politicians, so that the work, therefore, if they're not going to do it, has to be done by someone. And mm -hmm. that someone right now, in terms of what I want to do in my life, is to do that work at a philosoph philosophical level, saying actually a libertarian or a liberty oriented society is one which is closest to achieving some of these desires outcomes where you meld in this case good intentions with actual good ideas mm -hmm. absolutely phenomenal the and just just to touch on the one point where you spoke about addiction and alcoholism just I, I, I am a firm believer that alcohol is legal and that marijuana is legal as a control mechanism because you keep people high and drunk they will complain less and they will protest less and they will stand up and defend themselves less. So how do, how do people support the ideology? I mean, is there, uh, you know, I don't want to sort of favor political party. Is there a movement at the moment that people can get involved with or does this evolve more on the ground within communities, within their thinking, within how they treat and deal with one another? Yeah. Great question, because it's, it's often something which I, I'm very quick to clarify. I don't stand for any political party. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did say at the beginning, just for open 
uh, books. And, you know, I obviously cut my teeth politically in the DA a long time ago. Mm. Um, but yeah, that, that was at a personal level. It wasn't something mm. which, you know, I, I was never, I've never been a public representative for any political party. Um, and that still carries to this day. You know, I don't, I don't say, in fact, if you watch my show, one of the things I often say is hashtag politicians are trash because I don't mm. actually believe that politicians are the way out for South Africans. Mm. I believe uh, for most of us that these ideas that I'm transmitting, <clears throat> you need to infuse them at a grounded community and family level where you reach out to individuals and you build something from the ground up. That's that Mazakela movement mm -hmm. I was referring to a bit mm -hmm. earlier on, which hasn't been quite codified yet. There's no organization yet, but we're working on, on doing exactly that. So that you have at a community level, various cells across the country, which are Afriforum-like, right? Mm -hmm. Only they don't cater to one um, cultural grouping as Afroforum Afri does. You know, I'm, I'm, again, let me be precise. I'm not saying mm. Afroforum is just whites only, but it does, and unashamedly so, and quite rightly mm. so, um, advocate that it, it's for the Afrikaans community because they yes. feel it is a minority group that they need to support. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine. So that the Mazakela movement is um, will take from that but extrapolated to all South Africans in a non-racial way and say, actually, at a community level, how can people organize themselves to be able to address a lot of these issues, right? Firstly, how do we as community members support the various broken families in the community? Yeah. So stop expecting the state to come in mm -hmm. and, and solve this issue. Let's begin to solve it ourselves. So if you know that there is a child-headed household in your community or a single-parent household, how do we as a community put up local infrastructure, whether it's social or physical, that supports those individuals. Let me be specific here. So one of the projects that we were looking to do is to build a, um, a ECD center, Early Childhood Development Center. Um, actually, let me not maybe get into details now because, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but basically, to drive the policy of having an ECD center that is either free or heavily subsidized for people who, uh, for single mothers, you know, who are mm -hmm. struggling or for child-headed households, so that that parent has the opportunity to know that their child is in a safe place during the day, to allow them to then Huge. search for yeah. work and et cetera, et cetera. All of these things have a, a great spill-off in the community in which you enact these things. And this is what the Mazakele movement will be looking to do, having actual communities raise funds for themselves, raise their own infrastructure, mm -hmm. raise their own social infrastructure to address issues they are facing. Um, and again, you can go down the line insofar as the various things you can tackle by simply adopting a, a, um, a build it yourself approach or Mazakele mm. approach and a liberty ethos, one which says we use our freedoms for our benefit as a community. Um, and that's the tough stuff, you know, that's the stuff that requires, as I said, um, an on the ground approach. And so, that to answer your question, there is no political mm. party that we sort of push people in the direction mm -hmm. of. But rather, we say, here are a basket of ideas that are liberty orientated, that have an ethos of Mazakele, build it yourself. It's up to you, dear individual, up to you, dear community, to say these values, we see them in party X or politician X, or we as a community will raise someone up from our own community mm -hmm. to stand for elections. That's why as a, a, a brand, as a Big Daddy Liberty brand, I'm all for direct elections, um, and I'm all for, you know, uh, you know, removing politics from parties and having individuals at almost constituency level be a right. more appropriate way of organizing our politics because it serves what we're trying to do on the ground level, which is have communities become self-reliant to build things for themselves, to focus mm. on assisting the most vulnerable, but at the same time to then bring in the government as a supplementary, a supporting role, as opposed to being reliant on that right. government. So it, it, it's and the thing with more of a local level, more on a constituency level, there's more accountability because you are much Absolutely. closer to the people you're serving rather than the separation where you never see the community unless you're going to cut a ribbon, you know, and then show up and, and drive off um, in your, absolutely. In your you know, um, multiple cars. So absolutely important point. So, yep.
I mean, te- technically, we already have a similar system like that mm-hmm. at a local government level, right? Where, for example, if you remember the local government elections, yes. you have two ballots. The one is for your mm-hmm. actual ward councillor, the chap who lives down your road, who yes. should live down your road, and you know is immersed in the same problems you have, and therefore becomes your liaison between mm-hmm. a municipality and, and, and you as a community, right? And of course, the second ballot is for the PR ballot, the proportional representation, which is where the politicians or rather the political parties uh, milk the system. The, the point being, it's not like this is new stuff to South Africans. All we're saying is you want the system to be entrenched at a much yes. deeper level and to head up to much higher levels so that national government resources aren't allocated by some dude who sits in you know, a plush office in Pretoria right. mm. who, ha- who has no idea who you yeah. are in the community of Tofimbaba or Swellendam or Bof Adar or mm-hmm. Lepalali. He has no idea who you are. You're just a, a number to him. Um, and he has therefore no incentive to really care about what he's doing because at the end of the day, he gets a salary. Whether he has served you or not, he, as I said, doesn't give uh, two hoots. Uh, mm-hmm. So that what you therefore want is a system that brings that power to as local a level as possible. Um, and that's what we really stand for as the Big Daddy Liberty Brand. It's a very tough conversation to have insofar as people, even though they have a concept of it at a ward level, they, they struggle to conceptualize it sometimes at a national level. That actually, this can also be done at that level too. And that you, the ordinary individual, has to be the beneficiary of that. Not politicians, mm. not your favorite politicians either, um, and not government officials either, but you, the ordinary trap, the God-fearing, law-abiding, family-orientated South Africans who are often described South Africans are, regardless of race or culture. Absolutely, absolutely. What would you like to see happening in the next one year, five years, and ten years? What are your plans <laughs> moving forward? Yeah, this one is something I'm literally grappling with right now, uh, insofar as we're rejigging uh, uh, the Big Daddy think- Liberty Bread. Okay, perfect. So kick mm-hmm. off. <laughs> I got to run for a pee. <laughs> no, that's I'm fine. That's fine. Okay. I'll pick it up give me two minutes. minutes. Okay. Minutes. I'll see Sorry. you now. All right. Hang on. Just Sorry. remind me. I'm going to pause the. Okay. Right. And we're recording again. So your one year, five year, and ten year vision plan. What are you mm-hmm. planning to do? And what would you also like to see happen? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think it's one which, uh, as I said, I'm grappling with right mm-hmm. now. And here's here's the you know uh, you know much like um, much like Jacob wrestles an angel so to speak. Uh, this is how I would, I would uh, uh, answer that. Sorry, mm-hmm. I got trapped by my own sentence construction. The the one year plan is we've got to as a brand start producing a lot more content and a lot more content aimed at education and not in a sort of boring bland way. Um, you know, but actually doing content that allows the chap who's sitting in a taxi uh, or waiting, you know, to get to his destination, mm-hmm. so open his phone, quickly see a 45 to 90 second video that describes a political value of addressing a current issue through the lens of liberty, using the approach of Mazakele or build it yourself. So that's the kind of content we're going to be pushing out and developing right. going forward. We're currently trying to build. I'm fundraising at the moment to try and build a um, not a big studio, like a just a set mm-hmm. for the show. Mm-hmm. I'm just pausing for this helicopter. Cool. Yeah. Just on that point, and it, it, something maybe we can discuss now or at a later time. How important, because mm-hmm. looking at the UK as an example, where they rolled out very powerful fiber to their villages so that people mm-hmm. could work from home and save that hour and a half, two hour commute. If we're looking, how important is internet and internet access and free internet access to the development mm-hmm. of economies and the empowerment of families in villages, in smaller towns and so on? Greatly important. Mm. Greatly important. Uh, the, the prime example is the UK, uh, mm-hmm. but an even better example is, is a country like China. Uh, China, the most remote village there, has access to stable, reliable, and very fast internet. And what it's done, for example, is it's, it's exposed people who ordinarily were very cut off from mm-hmm. the mainstream, either mainstream economy, mainstream news cycle, or whatever the case may be, to that mainstream and allowed them to also, on the one, in a, in a 
iterative way, in other words, back and forth way, um, mm -hmm. gain information and be able to also put out information. Uh, let me be specific. I mean, for example, using China as an example, there's this viral lady now, uh, her name is Rose. Uh, she's a Ugandan lady who uh, moved to China, got married to a Chinese man. And she now sort of does these daily videos uh, you know, showing her culinary skills and life in a village, and she speaks sure. fluent Mandarin. Um, and her stuff, as I said, is it's watched by millions of people around the world. And where she lives in China is a super remote village, a small village, and even that village life is something that she shares with her viewers, and people kind of go, whoa. People know each other. Uh, people actually have. You can go to random people's, not random, but like you know, you can go to neighbors' place and have lunch or dinner, whatever. There's a sense of actual community mm -hmm. there, and again, it's open people up um, in that sense. So to answer your question, in a South African context, it's sorely, sorely needed, especially in the rural areas, in where I work, because on the one hand, it would allow those people access to information beyond just the SABC as a mm -hmm. state-owned news broadcasting agency. Um, and it also allowed them to consume podcast spaces where the news and current affairs is digested through the analysis of different people, you know, people mm -hmm. who have different views in society. I would be a beneficiary of that. Other podcasters, inc including you, mm -hmm. would be beneficiaries of that. Um, and it's, it goes beyond just media. You know, people can also use the internet uh, for productivity uh, uh, reasons. I mean, one, one of my neighbors, because uh, I have a farm, a family farm, um, one of our neighbors sometimes uses the Wi Fi uh, mm -hmm. from me on the farm. And what she says is, you know, I've started looking up YouTube videos on how to boost productivity of her cabbages and her other vegetables to the point where now she sells a bigger amount of surplus than she used to historically have. Sure. So it's those things that I've argued, you know, technology in the context of your question plays an instrumental not just technology, but connectivity rather, plays an instrumental level in boosting the living standards of people mm. uh, at a basic level. But to come back to the original question, uh, we're, we're literally in a year looking to build a just a set that we can produce content from. Right. Um, have sorry, have you got a costing? Pause, okay, yeah. Because I'm mindful of that grinder noise. But nonetheless, <laughs> you can hear, it, hear yeah. me. Um, to your question, yeah, we have a, a, a cost. Um, it's around sixty thousand uh, okay. to build the set, but and you know, thankfully we're about twenty grand mm. uh, in it, so kind of nearly there, but not quite. <laughs> how how um, do people so support you on that? Uh, right now, I would argue that uh, because I've, I've physically been going out to you know directly ask people hey man are you mm. willing to throw a grant towards mm, this mm. so i don't really have a crowdfunding method so far what i will argue is that you know you can give through the institute of race relations i'll give that information to you after this and maybe you could if you can we'll put it with uh, in post edit put it on the screen or even just put it in the descriptor but if you can give through the institute of race relations that'll be one avenue in which you can do that um, and just market Big Daddy Liberty, or whatever the mm -hmm. case may be. Uh, but we'll give that information at the end. So that's the, the short-term goal, to build the set so we can start pumping out content mm -hmm. that reaches many more people. But more than that is to really upscale the advocacy work. So basically, in the couple of years ahead of me, I'll be traversing this country, uh, doing the hard work of building these Mazakele uh, cells, if you will, right. these these, these uh, small, uh, sorry, for lack of a better word, um, <laughs> cells. I can't really think of a word to sort of describe mm. them. Uh, I'm trying to avoid the word cells because it sounds sort of like sort of yeah. yeah there you go, <laughs> communities. Uh, <laughs> um, cells may sound like something else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, have the attention of law enforcement. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, no, it's these small communities of empowered individuals who are doing work on the ground. So much like you'll see, maybe if you live in Pretoria or some rural community, like people don, donning Afroforum t-shirts, cleaning mm -hmm. curbs, filling potholes, we're looking to do exactly the same thing, but in a non-racial way and in communities right. where the, the sort of ethos is actually more helpful because you know it, it, it shifts people away from this reliance on government to them relying on themselves so we'll definitely be doing a lot more of that 
uh, work, you know, me traveling around the country to first mm -hmm. build, those cells, train individuals, and then train them also in fundraising, firstly amongst themselves, but also bringing mm -hmm. in uh, bigger funders. You know, I can foresee a community in Tofu Baba approaching Discovery and saying, hey, uh, or any other corporate, you know, name names, but like mm -hmm. any other corporate saying, hey, if you throw just 10 grand at us, it helps us maintain our local crash or yeah. whatever the case may be, right? So it's empowering people with those skills to be able to actually say, hey, how do we take charge of our own community? How do we develop skills that fund and resource ourselves? And then how do we deliver things for ourselves? And then the state can be a supporting uh, role in that. If you can do that work, mm -hmm. if you can change that ethos in ordinary South Africans, then it begins to change the politics because those people then suddenly have very high expectations around mm -hmm. what politicians should be doing to support what they are doing. And I've always said this, this is the final gasp. Mm. If you want to change a society, it takes a society that is at the cusp of crisis. And in a society that is at the cusp of crisis, it is he who injects the greatest volume of ideas into that society who will change as society. Mm -hmm. So that's the work I'm doing now, is to inject that volume of ideas, if you will, to ordinary people in order to change this country into something we want it to be. That's incredibly powerful. And what I understand from that is teaching people that they can be self-sufficient. And when they mm -hmm. become self-sufficient and raise their quality of life and their, their the quality of existence that then they will fight their politicians to maintain what they themselves have built. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's a philosophy which I take from my religious roots in a sense, mm. where, you know, I always used to say Nirvana is, is not for this world, but mm. actually it is insofar as we have a creation, we have a duty upon me to create the type of society to will heaven, if you will, onto those plans and create the conditions for it. And once you have that approach, it helps you realize almost directly that the responsibility to do something about it is yours. The responsibility yes. to do the work, if you will, is yours. Rabbi Nachman, for example, speaks about this quite a lot. Um, it's this idea that we have agency to put in the work, if you will, of creating the kind of society, creating the kind of world in that context, in the Jewish context, you know, mm. that brings um, heaven here to us. Yes. And it's a principle which you can build ordinary people also. So listen, you can create the conditions in which you live in. You don't have to wait for this nirvana that you hope will be on the other side of things. Yeah, and, and that's the reality of what you spoke about earlier, walking into a, a corrugated iron shack, but seeing how maybe it's newspaper on the floor or on the walls and magazines cut out as pictures, but it's spotless inside and it's, uh, they've, they've, with very little, they've created a home for the family that they have or even for themselves. And that's the power that the individual has. I think it's, I love what you're doing because it's reminding and re-educating people that they have that power to change. They have that power to build what they want. And then even the best part is they have the power to hold those in power accountable for their power, the way they use the power. Absolutely. It's this notion, um, you know, and again, you just encapsulated it perfectly, but it's this notion that if you really want to say it's in Africa, um, as a lot of these billboards now, <laughs> political season say, uh, say it's in Africa, say it's in Africa, I'm like, actually, yeah. say it's in Africa is not a function of what politicians and political parties or government will do, but yeah. rather the ethos you can instill, the ideas that you can inject into a society that is at the point of crisis yes. in order to change that society for the better. And that is the work of Big Daddy Liberty. Fantastic. Awesome. I think th that's a wonderful note to end on for this discussion. And uh, I want to say thank you so much for your time. Thank you for what you shared. And more importantly, thank you for who you are and what you do with that. Uh, and I said, thank you for your time. No, Absolutely. You, no. so I was just going to say thank you mm. for your time. I mean, uh, mm. uh, you know, we had a very delayed start. So no. People don't <laughs> so, know what that was about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, this is what I love. We are South Africans. 
because we make it happen. It doesn't matter. We don't care what's going on around us. We get frustrated and we moan about it at the dinner table, but we get it done. We wanted to do the podcast irrespective of what was happening. It doesn't have to be perfect to get it done. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And maybe on that note, uh, let yeah. me say thank you very much for having me thank you. on yeah. the show. And uh, yeah, uh, guys, if you are interested in the Big Dad Lips show, mm. you'll find me every Wednesday on any of your social media platforms, X, YouTube, Facebook, Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. And we have a Sunday evening show called Liberty and Friends at 8 p.m. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Looking forward to chatting to you again. I'm just going to end the recording and I'll say cheers.